think the science is coming through and you can tell the science is coming through because the backlash is huge. Industry's backlash and getting published rubbish data, which is absolutely appalling. There's just been this onslaught of nonsensical science, which is being published by major journals in, in Britain and the United States. And it just shows how scared they are because they're allowing this rubbish to be published. Welcome to the HVMN Podcast, your resource for evidence-based nutritional strategies, cognitive performance, and fitness science. Thank you for joining us. This week, we have someone you are probably familiar with, Professor Tim Noakes. With more than 750 published scientific articles and 70 marathons under his belt, Noakes is well known for his many contributions to nutrition and exercise science. At the beginning of his research career, he was an advocate for a high-carb diet, which is no surprise given the medical dogma at the time. Yet Noakes completely changed his mind when he learned about the value of the high-fat diet. Not only was he one of the first doctors to spur the ketogenic movement, running into many roadblocks along the way, but Noakes actually reversed his own type 2 diabetes using the diet. Perhaps one of the reasons he has upheld a high reputation is his continued desire to question current scientific theory, even conclusions he first helped define. Rather than turning a blind eye and staying with his preconceived notions, Noakes follows the evidence, a model we should all aspire to have. In this episode, hosts Jeff Wu and Professor Noakes discuss the basis of the central governor theory, aka the brain directly influencing physical performance output, how a ketogenic diet improves insulin resistance and therefore helps prevent chronic disease, and ponder over the institutional and societal blockers making this new way of eating difficult to gain wider acceptance. Professor Tim Noakes, really a pleasure to have you on the HVMN program. It's a privilege to be honored with you. Thank you so much. Our honor. Um, So our listeners are probably very familiar with your recent saga or relatively recent saga with some of the South African uh, regulatory folks related to nutrition by your stance and your thoughts around low carb ketogenic diet for metabolic health and, 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 and health and wellness. But on the other hand, you also have really had a storied career as an exercise physiologist. Um, a lot of the co- quote unquote common folk wisdom around uh, you know, carb loading or hydration or this notion of fatigue and a central governor theory came from you. Um, so given this storied career and the interest interesting notion from going from a carb loading advocate to now talking about low carb. How would you describe yourself at this point in your career? Well, I'm now very much retired, but I'm not retired because I'm still very active in promoting low carbs. But if we go back over my career, I trained as a medical doctor. And during my training, I realized a couple of things. Firstly, that I was much more interested in science in discovering new ideas than in simply regurgitating what was already known. So I'd rather write the book than have to read it and learn it. I also saw that the costs of medicine were rising dramatically already in the 70s. Mm. And most of it was the treatment of chronic disease. And I thought, well, that's not the help because I saw how ineffective the treatments were. And I said, it would be much better to spend a little bit of the money on prevention. And I said, well, there are many good doctors looking after chronic disease. I think there needs to be some doctors who are trying to promote prevention. And so I chose to go that route. And I helped develop sports science and sports medicine in South Africa. And during that time, I, as, I, as you indicated, I got interested in fluids and exercise and how the brain regulates performance. And for a long time, thought that carbohydrates were the king. They really were essential for exercise performance. And then in about 2010, I suddenly realized I got it all wrong and decided that I better stop harming people because the books that I'd written said that high carbohydrate diets are ideal. And I realized I was wrong. And if you had insulin resistance and you followed that advice, you were very likely to develop develop type 2 diabetes. So I said, it's time to change. I acknowledged my error and I said, I apologize, but we really have to understand that these high carbohydrate diets are not for everyone. And the consequence to that was that I irritated my profession so much that they decided I had to be tried for unprofessional conduct, uh, for doing a few things on Twitter which they didn't like. And that was, a, that was actually a front. It had nothing to do with that because everything I said on Twitter was completely correct medically, as we eventually proved. So I went through 28 days of trial, 
And what my, my legal team advised me to do was let's put the low carbohydrate diet or the high carbohydrate diet on trial and see which wins. And in the end of the day, the low carb diet won. So, so we were very happy about that. And I managed to save my career because I'd been targeted publicly to be humiliated in South Africa and the world. And I decided I wasn't going to let that happen because my whole career would have collapsed. And I felt I had to keep going and, and make sure that legacy was intact. A hundred percent. And that just reminds me of Galileo, these historical scientists. I mean, I, you know, we can let history judge the comparison there, but obviously within your field, I just want to underline and unpack some of the things you were talking about. And it just as a reminder, in the 70s and 80s, sports science wasn't a field. So when you're saying that you helped develop sports science, I don't think it's a far stretch to say that you know, you're one of the first seminal people to really make this uh, a profession, given the timing and perhaps the, it, it was that, so that's interesting. And then second, which I think is very interesting is that it's very rare for anyone, but I think especially in academia to, to say, whoops, you know, I was wrong for 20 years of my career and, and, and I, I, I'm, I'm going to correct that. Um, so uh, I guess we should probably go into the sports field first and then probably unpack just in, in, in terms of chronological order here. Um, so the typical notion of carb loading, hydration, central governor theory, uh, perhaps we can go through one at a time. I mean, maybe we talk about carb loading first. Um, that's uh, a meme that's very popular in endurance sports. Um, what is still valid there? Because obviously there is some role potentially for carbohydrates, especially your longer in performance. Uh, and what was overstated and what should we, we be more nuanced about? Yeah, absolutely right. So carbohydrate loading came in in the 1960s. And just to remind you that before 1968, there was no real interest in sports science, but that was the year that the Olympic Games were held at altitude in Mexico City. Mm. And athletes went to Mexico City not knowing how to compete at altitude. And a few countries sent the athletes there to train before the Olympic Games. And people said, we, we absolutely don't know what's going to happen to these athletes. And that, that was really the stimulus for the beginning of sports medicine. It was also because the East Germans competed for the first time and they were successful. And they had applied science. Of course, they'd applied drugs as well, but they'd applied science. <laughs> They're pharmacologically enhanced. And the U.S. realized that he has a real competitor and we need to get involved in sports medicine. I know that the doctor who went with the U.S. team to the Olympic Games in 1968, he was literally phoned up a couple of nights before the Olympic team went to, to the Games and said, would you like to come to this Olympic Games? I mean, that's how unprofessional, how amateur it all was. So I was so fortunate because I started my career in medicine in 1969, the year later. And so therefore, the first 20 years of my life, I could actually know most about what was happening in sports medicine because it was still so small. You could be sort of knowledgeable about everything. Today, of course, it's such a vast field. Right. Anyway, so 1970, I start doing physiology and realized that this is my real passion. And the first studies of carbohydrate loading are starting to come forward. And the people from Sweden are doing muscle biopsies. They're measuring muscle glycogen. And they're coming to the conclusion that this is everything. Carbohydrates in the muscle determines your performance. And of course, we should have been warned, listen, it's not one thing. You can't reduce all of performance to one thing. Right. But we were so enticed by it that we fell into the trap. And so when I started becoming an exercise physiologist in Syria, serious exercise physiologist in the 1980s, you had to be able to do two things to be a physiologist. You had to measure an athlete's maximum rate of oxygen consumption. If you couldn't do that, you were hopeless because that was the one factor that determined performance. Right. VO2 max is, the, is, another, is a common parlance. People love citing their VO2 max scores. Absolutely. Our problem was we started looking at VO2 max and we said, well, actually, there's such a wide range. of You could have the same athlete performance, but their VO2 maxes could be quite different. And the other thing was that we were told, and this, if you wanted to publish a paper in those days, you had to say this, you had to say that there was a plateau 
in oxygen consumption before the athlete terminated exercise. So in other words, you're meant to see the oxygen consumption goes up, 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 up like this, and then the athlete tires and no more oxygen consumption. This is plateau phenomenon. Mm-hmm. And it was, that was a, a gold standard. And if you didn't say that, you couldn't publish your papers. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we didn't find that on every athlete. And we were using fairly simple systems, but we couldn't find it. And so we would say we can only find this plateau phenomenon in 10% of the population or the, of the athletes. Hmm. And so you either had to lie or we told the truth. And fortunately, then that made me realize that the, if you don't get a plateau, then it's not the muscle running out of oxygen. And in time, we realize it's the brain regulating performance. And the system is regulated. It's homeostatically regulated. And you can't ever let the system fail because then you're dead. Yeah. And so exercise physiology was based on a false premise that the system failed and then you got tired. And we, over the last 10 years or show, so, have shown that fatigue is purely an emotion. It's just your brain is using this fake emotion to make sure you don't kill yourself. So that, that's been a major uh, advance, as you know. But to get back to the muscle, so sorry, so what I was saying, to be an exercise physiologist, you firstly have to measure VO2 max, and then you have to do a muscle biopsy and measure glycogen in the muscle, and then your all systems go by. Then you're world class. Now you can do everything. And so we, I was the first guy to do muscle biopsies in South Africa, and we did muscle biopsies on everyone, and we loaded them with carbohydrates, and we couldn't find much evidence that carbohydrates were really helpful, but that didn't matter because we knew it was true. And we were also the first in the world to develop this goos or squeezes that you run with and you squeeze into your huh. mouth. <laughs> no, you know all about yeah. those. So we developed them. They were called the Lepin FRN. And Fordyce was the great ultramarathon runner in South Africa. Bernard Rose was the marathon champion. And I was the exercise physiologist. So it was FRN. And if you go on Google Lepin FRN, you'll see that we were the first to, to develop it. So I'm acutely embarrassed now that <laughs> we took athletes down the wrong route for so many years that the carbs are going to make you go faster. Right. So the end result was when I wrote my book, Law of Running, which was very widely read, uh, it said carbohydrates are crucial for performance. And the first three or four chapters are all about how nutrition is the key driver of performance and particularly carbohydrates. And I realize now that actually the brain's the key driver. So as I rewrite the book, I'm focusing more on on how these chemicals in the periphery, in response to what you're eating and drinking, uh, influence the brain to allow you to go faster. But the key is that it has to act through the brain in some way to allow you to go faster. I think we touched upon a couple interesting aspects. The central government theory uh, talked about a VO2 max, and we talked a little bit about carbohydrate and glycogen. Um, I think, I think at, at, I said, let's say in the modern era, it seems almost intuitive that the brain is a, a, a central governor or a critical to performance. I mean, I think we all have the intuitive experience that we feel really, really good today. We do better. We feel very depressed. We do worse. Um, and, I, and some would say that some of the most interesting findings or results seem intuitive or obvious after the fact. Um, and I think it was interesting to hear the history that in the past, VO2 max and muscle glycogen or carbohydrate availability were the two primal uh, f- causes. But you know, we're moving towards this notion that actually the brain is a central pro- proximal cause and there's much many inputs going into the brain. Um, so unpacking specifically on carbohydrate, um, would you say that, obviously, if you eat a low-carb diet, you can go through the process of gluconeogenesis, produce carbohydrate from protein uh, or, or, or some of your exogenous nutrition coming in. Um, given your... Uh, recent evolution on this topic. Is there a role for carbohydrate for heavy weight lifting, anaerobic exercises, um, or are we very much in the camp now of you don't even need to worry about it? If you if you eat a well formulated ketogenic diet or low carb diet, you can still have maximal performance in anaerobic style performance. 
Yeah, I don't think we have the evidence yet to to say absolutely one way or the other. I, mm-hmm. I know that there are athletes who can do it, but but the reality is that they are probably using carbohydrate whilst they are doing those intense exercises. So it's not as if you don't have any muscle glycogen because you're on a high fat diet. You do have muscle glycogen. And so it would be impossible for us to say that this person is not using carbohydrates when they're doing those explosive events. They almost certainly are. Mm-hmm. So it's very difficult. But the, where I think the changes come is as you become fat adapted. And what guys like Jeff Olick have shown and, and our own studies have shown and Louise Burke from the Australian Institute of Sport has shown is that world-class athletes have an incredible capacity to burn fat and that we've completely underestimated the ability of the muscle to burn fat. Mm -hmm. I think Louise Burke's study is the one which I really find most interesting because she's not very pro high fat diets. But if you look at her data, she shows that within three weeks, she took world-class walkers, race walkers, and she showed that within three weeks of this high fat diet, during racing intensity at 25K racing intensity, these people were burning 1.5, 1.7 grams of fat per minute and about half a gram of carbohydrate per minute. They were almost completely closed down all their carbohydrate metabolism. Right. And they were running and they were racing at, at competitive speeds. And so my view would be that this is not because they've tooled up the muscles dramatically. It's because that's always that capacity is there. What they've done is going on the high fat diet. They've reduced their insulin, and they've allowed now the fat to be become the major fuel. Mm-hmm. So, so we we currently we have a paper that we've submitted and. I don't want to go too far to say what it's all about, but what we did show was that in high intensity exercise at 80% of VO2 max, it doesn't matter whether the person's eating a high fat diet or high carbohydrate diet, their performance is the same. Interesting. So that would be performance of five Ks or five, let's say three to five Ks. So I think we're focusing in now that if you're running three to five Ks, you've got enough glycogen in the muscle and you can burn lots of fat you don't need a high carbohydrate diet. That's really interesting because I think once you get beyond that five, six, 10, 15, 20 Ks for the average athlete, they can up tool and just burn fats and they certainly don't need high carbohydrate diet. That leaves us with people exercising from 100 meters up to say three to five Ks. And that, that's where the, the question remains. Will they benefit by high carbohydrate diets? And, and that we we can't, we can't, we can't yet answer. Absolutely. I, and I think I appreciate the nuance there because I think in the world of Twitter and polarizations, it's easy to be carbs are king or carbs are useless. And I think as you're unpacking here for us, a lot of nuance. And I would say that, you know, one paradigm that I've been thinking a lot about and curious here thoughts are, is that there is some orthogonality between maximal longevity or metabolic health versus performance. Um, Is there an argument that if you're looking to win an Olympic gold medal at your event, maybe within the sub 5K range as you're describing, is it worth it to spend, you know, two years, four years, eight years jamming as much carbohydrate as possible and potentially harming your long-term health, but you maybe get that advantage of having very upregulated carbohydrate uh, function. Um, maybe you can do some training around being metabolically flexible, fast a little bit in between. But, 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 but the main point is have a lot of carbohydrate during that period um, uh, for that short-term potential benefit at the cost of potentially decreasing your health span long-term. Is there a potential argument to be made there to basically differentiate or just tease out longevity, health span versus I want to just burn the candle real quick eat a bunch of carbs, maybe give myself diabetes or pre-diabetes in 10 years, but hey, I have a shot to win a gold medal. I think you make the point very clearly. And you see, I'm a great example. I was never an elite Olympic athlete, but I, on checking my own data from when I was 28, I was profoundly insulin resistant. Mm. I had a fasting insulin of 30 units and, and I like, we like to be below six units. That Once you're above six, we know that you've got long-term problems. If you if you're running with a fasting insulin of six or seven, uh, 
you will get problems in the long term. And of course, higher, it'll just come quicker. Right. So I was a walking time bomb. And no one had told me. And although I saw the data, and we didn't know what insulin resistance was in those days. And so I developed my type 2 diabetes at the age of 60. So, and I probably had it about 55, but I, I didn't check for it enough. And my fasting, insulin, fasting glucose looked okay. It wasn't great, but it wasn't diagnostic of diabetes. But I think if I'd done better testing, I would have known that I actually have had diabetes for 10 or 15 years uh, or 10 years before I made the diagnosis. So I'm a really good example of what happens if you take a person who's got lots, who's insulin resistant on a genetic basis and eats a high carbohydrate diet, you will run into trouble in, in the long term. So I don't see any advantage of eating one gram more carbohydrate than you need. That, that's the key. And I would like to encourage people to experiment and not to say, as I do in the book, Law of Running, that you must just overload on carbohydrates and as much as you possibly can. I mean, we were telling people in the tour to eat a kilogram of carbohydrate every day. I mean, I don't know how they survived on that. I don't know how the gut flora worked. And I don't know how the insulin spiking must have been horrendous. I mean, for Americans, that's 2.2 pounds of carbohydrate, which is a lot of food. That's just a lot of food. Exactly. And I would rather say, you know, get by on the minimum amount of carbohydrate that you need. And because that's going to be for your long term life expectancy, that's going to be the ideal. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think athletes are realizing that, that there's no real advantage of, of over ingesting carbohydrate. And uh, you, you see, I, in this, when we were working through this paper about how much uh, how, how intense exercise could you do on a high fat diet? I've discovered these studies showing that you actually burn quite a lot of fat at high intensity exercise, even maximal exercise. Oh, okay. It's difficult for us to measure it, but it's there. People are burning fat. And the one study by Larson, my friend Paul Larson in New Zealand, showed that the difference between the best sprinters that he studied wasn't because the, the fastest guys were burning more carbs, they were burning more fat. He used an unusual technique to show it because it's so difficult to measure it. But that was his conclusion. So it, again, I just mentioned that, that sprinters may actually be burning quite a lot of fat and it doesn't fit with the paradigm. How would you explain that? Because as you say, the paradigm is, okay, if you are sprinting, you're probably ma reaching VO2 max very, very quickly and you will go into fermentation or anaerobic, rest, uh, anaerobic met met metabolism. So the problem is that a 1920 study <laughs> is quoted. Okay. This is the basis for the fact that you can't exercise on a high fat diet. And there was an intervention where they had athletes or humans exercising on high carbohydrate or high fat diets and the guys on the high fat diet did very badly and so they said you can't oxidize fat rapidly to for high performance and that's it 1920 it's one of those foundation myths on which we build everything okay and so everyone quotes that study and then they say that olympic athletes have to burn carbohydrates to win gold medals but when you look for the evidence, it's actually, it's not there. That's point one. Point two is that as you know the physiology, as you start to exercise more vigorously and you become more acidotic, you release carbon dioxide from your body stores. And this comes out and so that falsely raises your respiratory quotient. And we use the respiratory quotient to predict how much fat and carbohydrate you're burning. Mm. And the higher the respiratory quotient, the more carbohydrate you're burning. So during exercise, we are biased. We are underestimating how much fat you are burning. And that's why we can't really measure it. And uh, so it, it was, took Paul Larson to show that actually we do burn some fat during high-intensity exercise. And it may be much more than we think. So essentially the argument is that there is, obviously you're still breathing, you'll still be able to use uh, fat oxidation and fat will still be a, a, a substantial portion of overall fuel expenditure. And I think that's a nuance that I think is left out of the Twitter uh, sphere where most, everyone's always burning a mix of substrate. It's never just sugar, just fat, it's always a mixture. And let me just add another point, which I had some argument with another guy, and then he actually stopped on Twitter, he just went off. Yeah. But I said, if you are a Tour de France cyclist, 
And he's saying, oh, but you see, you've got to have lots of glycogen so that you can sprint up the mountains. Well, well, okay, that's fine, but you could get that glycogen by burning fat. So if, you're, if you can exercise at 85% of your VO2 max burning mainly fat, the time you have to go to 90% as you're finishing up these huge kills that they go up, then you've got the glycogen, it's stored in the muscle, it's still there because you stored it the night before and you haven't used it in the first four hours of the flat stage. Right. You're just burning fat. So now you can use more carbohydrates up the, the final slope. But, but that doesn't come into their equation because they're right. so convinced that you can't burn fat at high intensity exercise. And the question I ask is, so where do you make the cutoff? What is high intensity exercise? We've studied an athlete who at 92% of VO2 max was still burning way more than 50% of his energy was coming from fat. So that, you know, and that, that's how much, if you really adapt, but you have to adapt, you have to do high intensity training on a high fat diet. Yep. Then you can increase your fat oxidation rates remarkably, even at high intensities. So yeah. the future for me is that athletes will use less and less carbohydrates in training and, and they'll do more intensive training on, on the higher fat diets to make their muscles burn at 90%, they'll be burning predominantly fat. That, the, that's the capacity is there. And, and if it's not there in everyone, the athletes who can do it will be the ones who will be the winners in the long term. In other words, if it's a genetic thing, they'll be selected and they'll start to win as a result. Absolutely. I think that's a good segue into you know, some of the more popular topics in discussion with the folks that we work with in physiology, in sport, which is this notion of metabolic flexibility, which you're describing. Um, how, how much can you switch back and forth between different substrate and how high can you be burning fat at higher and higher intensity? The idea has risen that, that a high fat diet makes you metabolically inflexible. <laughs> really? It's a high carbohydrate diet that makes you metabolically inflexible. And it's not my idea. My PhD student, Chris Webster, pointed that out to me. He, we took this athlete who, who could burn at 90%, who could burn so much fat. And then we did a VO2 max test on him. And he did a great VO2 max in which he burned lots of carbohydrate. So here he was with the capacity to burn 1.7 grams of fat right. per minute, but he could also burn a huge amount of carbohydrate when he was at VO2 max. Interesting. So what I was getting to was that, um, one, let's talk about the adaptation periods. I think that's something that a lot of people don't, or, or at least there's an open discussion of debate. Do you need six weeks to adapt? Do you need two years to adapt? Um, and then part two, which I think was interesting, was that what you're suggesting, what your PhD student described is that it's a kind of a one-way door where if you're very uh, fat um, uh, optimized for fat metabolism, you don't lose your ability to metabolize carbohydrate. But if you're fully optimized towards carbohydrate metabolism, you potentially build up insulin resistant and that reduces your ability to metabolize fat. I think that's an interesting point to discuss. But the first part of the question, um, which is, you know, I, I think it potentially an open area of discussion and, and, and work is, what does adaptation mean? I think some people say, you know, they feel really crappy on switching to a keto diet for two weeks. Is that too short? What in your experience is the right level to fully adapt? And are there strategies to accelerate that adaptation? Uh, should one consider intermittent fasting, high intensity interval training on top of reducing carbohydrate intake to potentially accelerate uh, upregulating fat uh, oxidation? My general view would be that you don't want to add too many stresses at the same time. So that if you are adapting to the diet, just adapt to the diet. Don't now increase your intense training because it's going to happen. If it happens in six weeks or, or three months, does it really matter? Yeah. In a study we did where we repeatedly tested people over six weeks on short duration, high intensity exercise, within two weeks, their performance had normalized. So it, it looked at this in this group, just two weeks was good enough. But I, mm. on the other hand, I've helped world-class athletes and some of them say it took them 10 months to, to really get fully adapted in training. And they noticed now the advantages in competition. So I, I think it, it can be a long time and, and maybe it takes 10, week, 10 months, but you just you keep going until you see what the outcomes are. That's a good point because I think if you were to argue or still man the opposite argument, it is that, um, you know, I'm, I've been doing this for three months. My performance is still not there. I'm doing this for six months. I guess you could send an argument. Could you be in a 
impossible to fend situation where you just need to adapt longer, adapt longer, just this, this argument to regression. Um, how would you counter that argument that, okay, there's no, there's no bar. You, I, you just haven't been, you know, there's no true Scotsman. You just haven't done it hard enough. Uh, how would you address that concern? I'd give you six months. And if you hadn't adapted after six months, I'd say, that's it. You're not going to adapt and okay. go back to your carbohydrate diet. And that might be a genetic component. Uh, that, They're going that's... to be outliers who don't adapt. That, that will always happen. I remember one guy phoning me and saying, he was a really good athlete, and he said, I'm at 20 grams of carbs a day, I can't even get out of bed. <laughs> I said, okay, maybe we should put you back to 100. On 100 grams carbs a day, he was perfect. He could do everything that he could do. So you, you know, we say that carbs are not essential, but it's clear to me that some people do need a little bit of carbohydrate, external carbohydrates, to, to perform. And why that should be, who knows, but they probably have some sort of metabolic, slight metabolic difference, and they, they need carbohydrates to fuel the Krebs cycle and so on. 100% agree with that. Mental fatigue, brain fog. We've all felt our brain sluggishly turn its gears at some point. In addition to a healthy lifestyle involving good sleep, diet, and exercise, our RISE nootropic may be just the key for preventing this pesky mental state. With RISE, we carefully selected three ingredients and matched clinical dose recommendations for all of them, Bacopa Maneri, Ashwagandha, and CDP Choline. We do not believe in the common kitchen sink approach you'll see with many other nootropics and instead craft targeted formulas with evidence-based compounds. Until May 26, 2019, you can save 10% off RISE. Visit www.hvmn.com slash pod to activate this time-sensitive offer. The link is also available in the show notes. Now back to the episode. Now, moving to central governor theory, um, what were the, some of the key insights that brought you that notion? Again, going back, it's, it seems intuitive almost obvious today that the brain is so important to performance. But again, rewind 20, 30 years ago. Um, this was a new field of inquiry. Uh, everyone was looking at VO2 max and muscle glycogen as the two only, uh, drivers of performance. Um, and it sounds like you started getting seeing some data that there was you know, very little correlation between those two markers for performance. Uh, what centered you around the brain and what does that inform us about training? Um, it, it's the one thing that's funny to me is that knowing that it's the brain doesn't mean that you can just trick your brain. The best way to almost trick your brain is to exercise a lot and eat well. So it's almost like um, you might know the mechanism. Um, how do you use that mechanism to inform your training, inform your lifestyle to optimize performance? The key bit of evidence for me was when we started measuring electrical activity in the muscles. And for the other model to be true, it predicts that you get tired when you're activating all the muscles in your lower limb. That's the point. So you, as you get tired, the muscle fibers stop working properly. You have to recruit more muscle and more muscle and more muscle until you've recruited everything. And then you're fatigued and you have to slow down because all the fibers have been activated and they're all getting tired. And when we tried to test that hypothesis, we found it was completely wrong that mm -hmm. that's not what happened that you only recruited up to about 40% of your muscle mass. And then it would decrease as you got tired. In some circumstances, it might increase, but, but it would never get to 100%. So the model was wrong. And that's where we realized, well, then obviously the brain's in charge. And I think people forget this, that to run faster, you have to recruit more muscle. You can't run faster without recruiting more muscle. And that kind of the message is, still hasn't got through to people, it's you must eat more something and then that'll make you run faster. No, you recruit more muscle and then you run faster. So that was what we began to realize that that was the case. And in time, we realized where does the brain come in? It's, it's producing this fatigue. And our mo most recent papers show that, that the key is that you, you have an emotional response to how you feel when you're running. So you get all this feedback and it either makes you feel good or bad or whatever, but, but sorry, th th then you get an emotional response. And in our clinical trials, where we race athletes against each other in the laboratory, the moment the one athlete goes ahead, the other guy starts to feel bad. He starts to <laughs> complain and his emotional state gets worse. And that's the first thing that happens. So that, 
And then the th- second thing that happens, he starts questioning, why is he doing it? Is it really worth continuing? And that's called the, the stopping wish or the quitting wish. Yeah. And, and those are the three components so we, which we now understand in the central governor model. Is that firstly, there is feedback from the periphery, from your internal and from your assessment of the environment. And then there's this emotion. How do I feel about what I'm doing? Is it making me happy or am I not happy? And I'm feeling dis- dis- distressed. And then finally, you start asking the question, what's, what's it worth? Do I really want to continue hurting myself for another hour to win the gold medal? Maybe I can slow down and win the silver medal and that's acceptable. <laughs> so that's what's going on in your head. And, and then you asked about training. Well, I think that training is to convince yourself that you can cope. But, but much more important than that is, what, what's the goal? Why are you doing it? That, that's the key. Yeah. And the coach has to get across that across to you, that this is really important and that you are the only athlete in the whole world who can do it. Yeah. One of the elegant things that you've written or you said in the past was that about this notion is that, well, we've all been to the point that you think you're going to die in performance, but then you just you go a little bit further or you take, you know, a 30 second break and you can keep going. Obviously you're not even close to dying. So there is something going on that's preventing you from hurting yourself, which I think is a very intuitive way to explain uh, this, this physiological model that you're describing. That you're describing. Um, so given that uh, the brain is so central to performance, um, Obviously, you know, traditional exercise is very focused on physical exercise to gain performance. If the brain is so important, um, could we hypothesize that things like meditation or mental training or uh, working on your mental fortitude to absorb pain and really define what your goals are, is there a role to just you know, look at the brain as a substantial portion of training where I think that that is starting to come into vogue, I would say in recent years, people start looking at the, you know, working on the mindfulness of the athlete. Um, Does this theory, does the model that you have suggest or propose specific protocols to work on the brain? Have you looked at that? Is that something of interest? Are there any potential strategies or hypotheses you have there to optimize training of the mind? I haven't really got thought about that. I've been involved more in the physiology and, and haven't really spent my time. How do we train people to, to perform better? Right. And yeah, it's because, it, you know, this is, to me, this is a black box. Still. I'm not, <laughs> so I have to leave that to other people. So I think my contribution was to say, you got to look at the brain. You've got to work on how, how people can train their brains. I think that there's, the there's so much to do with it's either genetic or the way you are brought up as a child that is so critical to performance. I'm reading a book at the moment and it looks at some of the greatest teams of, of all time, teams that perform beyond belief. So this is not individual sport, it's, it's, the, it's the team. Mm-hmm. And the interesting thing that they discover is that when you get a team together, they, they each of them underperform slightly. So by themselves, they're able to perform slightly better, but as soon as you get in the team, they oh. all sort of become the dependent and let everyone else do the work. And, and that's really interesting. And it turns out that the best teams, that all comes down to the leader. It all comes down to the captain, that he's able to lift the team to a different level because of his own leadership skills. So there it, there it is. He just manages to get these guys or she managed to get him, the girls or the boys, to perform at a higher level and not to let the performance go down because they're a team. That's interesting, yeah. It's fascinating that the natural inclination is to underperform. That's right. the natural inclination. But the end of, there are certain individuals. That's point one. And point two is if you look at some of the great athletes of all time, they came from abusive families. They had a, they had a family member who abused them. And I'm talking about physical, not sexual, but physical abuse. And it was coping with the physical abuse of the father particularly that allowed them when they got discomfort in exercise, it wasn't an issue because they'd lived with this abuse for so long. 
and, and that may be the one, but the other one, of course, is just the father that disappears from the family. So, so these are like psychiatric illnesses that, right. that help people do better. So it's, it's very complex, and it's not always the way you think it might be. Yeah, no, it's an interesting uh, uh, proposition where, you know, to have an outlier, extraordinary performance, you have to have some sort of extraordinary uh, uh, starting point or uh, initial condition. And potentially that's the line between madness and genius. If you are that far outlier, you literally are the best human out of 7 billion humans at something. There is some strange initial condition likely, and that might be really, really bad. You know, negative six uh, standard deviation or positive six standard deviation. Um, and I think going back to your story about leaders really uh, buffering up the whole team's performance, I think uh, that really resonates with me. You know, our, in our conversations with groups in the military, groups in uh, sports teams, that there's this notion of leadership. Uh, if you have a bad team leader, you know people in you know navy seal training or buds talk about that you swap a team leader you know the 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 boat racing team that had that would always win with that team leader uh you swap the team captains with the worst performing boat that next boat race uh that worst performing team is now winning those races um do you have some sense of what are characteristics of that leader um what can we learn from this? You know, what can we model ourselves after? Do you have some sense of pattern there? I worked with a team that won the the Rugby World Cup in 2007, and you know, you could walk into the room and know this team was un, was unbeatable. Huh. There was this sense of purpose and discipline and character and do the right thing when it's when you have to. It just it was pervasive. It was astonishing, and I think. There were four or five great leaders on the team, and that lifted everyone. I must mention that Joe Montana is one of the people in the book. And I know that uh, you have an interest with Joe yes, Montana yes. in San Francisco. And one of the reasons I have to get back to San Francisco and to meet you again in your offices is to meet Joe Montana. Yes, I remember we talked about that. We will make that happen. I have a series of football or rugby jerseys and I have to get him to sign. Okay, let's coordinate that. We can absolutely you know, make that happen. I would love to do that. Yeah. That would be super. Because I have was one lecture on performance and I have the, the catch and I go through the catch in great detail, which is really interesting for South Africans who follow rugby, which which is, of course, not American football. And I have to explain exactly what the circumstances were and what it meant and why it was such an amazing moment. Right. And how perfection comes down to inches. That's, that, that just epitomizes that moment. Absolutely. Well I, well, I think it just speaks to sport broadly. I think w one part of me is that who cares about other humans playing some artificial game? But I think it's a really a personification of ethic, discipline, you know, some of the cultural values that we choose to honor, right? So I think that's a good analogy. It's a good personification of some of these soft qualities, um, it, it, which is also I mean, going back to the uh, point around the mimetic feel of, okay, you sound like the energy in the room, I guess, temp matched the leaders who had this confidence, this swagger, this this inevitability and that permeated across uh, the entire organization. In that episode, winning the World Cup, there yeah. was a moment where South Africa could have got knocked out in one of the earlier games. The score was suddenly 2020, it had been 20-0 and it was suddenly 2020. Yeah. And the captain realized that the team had lost it and he called them together and he said, we didn't come here to lose to this team. Yeah. And he spoke yeah. to them because he picked up immediately and then the team just went away and quickly scored the points needed to to win the game. And they were totally dominant at the finish. Yeah. So again, they're just understanding his colleagues and understanding what was wrong and making the correct diagnosis and initiating the right intervention. Yeah. So if there's one takeaway that I can draw from this anecdote is that there's some intuition here. Spot the flagging confidence. And when the, there's that fear, have courage and lift everyone up and, you know, let's push this a little bit more, which I think... 
we all should think about when we have that flagging of courage, can we have the the discipline or willpower to, to yes, that is happening, but no, we're going to power through this. Yeah, um, be brave. And, yes. And in fact, that's what the coach told them before the final. He said, be brave, just be brave. <laughs> that is inspiring. So I think we discussed quite a bit about how you essentially, you know, almost created or were at least a seminal player in creating sports science. Um, going to a second big area that you've contributed towards and are now very vocal about, and I would say a thought leader in the space of, is this notion of low-carb diet for metabolic health, metabolic syndrome. As, as, you, as we all clearly know, and I know our audience, you know, is very aware of this, that diabetes rates skyrocketing, obesity rates skyrocketing. I mean, this is, these are unsustainable uh, chronic, decisions or, uh, chronic diseases that essentially, if we do not leave checked, will make society unlivable. If all of us are obese with diabetes, with neurological conditions like Alzheimer's, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, it's just not going to be sustainable. Um, how did you transition or expand your interest from the physiology world into broader uh, health uh, conditions. Um, was there an is some trigger point there? Uh, was it just a realization over your career as a doctor, physiologist, realizing and, and all, perhaps your personal journey, seeing that um, a lot of the things that we're working on exercise physiology can apply to everyone's just daily living, daily health? I think there are two factors. Firstly, my father died of type 2 diabetes and mm. I watched him die over 10 years being treated conventionally and he got all the complications of diabetes and I and there I was as a trained medical doctor not helping him I couldn't help him and that was very frustrating because I'd been taught that type 2 diabetes is an irreversible condition and it took him 10 years to die from diagnosis to death and it was a, oh just too terrible I won't even go into his condition when he died it was appalling so I watched this process and ultimately then I developed type 2 diabetes myself and realized I had 10 years to sort the problem out and mm. because that was what had taken my father 10 years to die. And I realized I've got 10 years to sort this thing out and fortunately I just the low carb diet and sorted my problem out relatively quickly and put my type 2 diabetes in remission. And I probably had the condition for 12, 13 years now. And cross fingers, I don't have any complications as yet. And I'm hoping I'm going to avoid them. So, so when I learned that, that insulin resistance is the most prevalent condition in the world, but we don't even teach it at medical school, then I asked the question, why not? And what I realized is that 85% of chronic disease is linked to insulin resistance. And the treatment is nutrition. And what we do and what we taught as doctors is we put each of the components of insulin resistance into a separate silo. Heart disease, dementia, obesity, hypertension, cancer. And we treat them in these different silos. Whereas if I was head of a hospital or a medical school, I'd say, no, no, no. They're all in the same silo. They're all the same disease. Right, the same primal cause. Exactly. And it's not pharmaceutical interventions. They don't work. They don't help. We've got to sort out the cause. And when I was in medical school, we were taught to look for the cause. And that doesn't happen anymore. It's now, what's the diagnosis? And here's the rote treatments. And if it doesn't say this is how you treat it, you don't treat it that way because then you're in trouble. Yeah. So th that's what's motivated me because as you indicated, we face a, a tsunami or a disaster heading our way. The obesity diabetes epidemic is going to destroy medicine and people don't see it. And we just delay, delay, delay. And we have to do something. And the answers are relatively simple. It's, it's not rocket science what we have to do. I mean, I think everyone, I would say, has good intentions, uh, assuming good faith, right? I, I don't think, we, I think we would both agree that doctors or uh, researchers that are more of the standard of care methodology are not trying to harm people. Um, I, I, academics aren't trying to mislead people uh, when they're publishing about carbohydrate and, and, and sort of the exercise physiology world. Um, I think that's something that I think 
more and more people are starting to realize is that what are what are the institutional blocks here where there are actually quite aggressive in blocking novel thought. I mean, this happened in your uh, academic career when you're publishing papers. You're mentioning that if you didn't have this kind of characteristic in publishing uh, for VO2 max for maximal performance, they would reject the paper or, or ask you to reanalyze your data. Uh, we're looking at insulin resistance as a root cause. And obviously, I would say in recent years, that has more wider acceptance. But Standard of care is very, very far from that. Um, perhaps just go, you know, starting at the very, very philosophical or high level there. Why is this happening? I, I think the goals are the same, right? I would say I would think that you know the doctor on the other side who's arguing for standard of care is saying, you know, I want to help people too. This is a tsunami. We should do something about it. Um, what they what do they have wrong, or what do we have wrong, right? Like someone is wrong. I I, I think good faith. Everyone wants to work on this problem. Uh, What's going on here? You know, I don't want to promote conspiracy theories, but <laughs> I've looked at it for a long time. And then what happened to me was clearly coordinated because I was asking questions that people didn't want to answer. And I just happen to think that the pharmaceutical industry and the food industry is so powerful that they control what's being taught at the medical schools. They control what the public are reading. They control the television networks. They control everything. And... And that's the reality. So there's only one message that people are going to get, and that's the one that promotes the industrial diet and mm. the use of, of pharmaceutical agents. And to get past that, it's impossible. You, you can't do it. The only way we can do it is to train each individual human to, to question and to experiment with different diets and find out what works for them. And then we slowly work through the doctors because if we can convert doctors eventually they will realize that this is the way to go. And I think social media has been very important in this because now today people will see what works and what doesn't work. And I tell my medical students that in 10 years time, if you're prescribing things that don't work, you won't have any patients because they will have gone onto the internet and they'll see that doing X, Y, and Z is what works. And there are millions of people reporting that it worked for them. And they will try it. And if it works, they won't go back to medicine. So, so I, I think we, the social media is the, is the only force we have to reverse what's been happening. So are, would you say you're optimistic? I think the social media, just given what we've seen in our community and, 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 and the growth and interest in the internet world around ketogenic diets, low-carb diets, would you say you're optimistic? I mean, you have built up quite a following on Twitter. We've seen an uptick in interest and discussion. Um, are we, you know, should we be optimistic? You know, I think conversations like these where we're nuanced, we're thoughtful, we're unpacking some of the mechanisms of action here is going to help accelerate this change. And I think we see it already where our listenership has been growing quite quickly over the last couple of years. Do you sense a title shift? No, absolutely. Oh, no. If you, in South Africa, you just have to go back five years. No one knew what the Banting diet, no one knew what the low carbohydrate right. diet is. Right. For a period, it was the topic of discussion among South Africans. And I can't go anywhere without being embraced and thanked every day for saving people's lives. And they, they start crying. And, you know, when I didn't do anything, I just wrote a book or something. Uh, they did it for themselves. And, and those people, the examples are remarkable. There's a, a Facebook page, the Banting Seven Day Meal Plan Facebook page in Cape Town. 1.5 million people. Three years ago, it had no followers. It's got 1.5 million. And it's from every possibly groups of South Africans, any race, any ethnicity, any age any gender, they're all there. And yeah. that's, and th this diet was thought to be for the elite and it's gone right across the country. Yeah, that's we're very encouraging. We're currently working with a domestic servant. So she's quite low on the social scale. She's written her own book on the low carb diet, the Banting book. I mean, isn't that astonishing? It's a movement, yeah. <laughs> she cured her diabetes on the diet. Yeah. She now wants to cure people like herself. So uh, yeah, I want to play devil's advocate for here for a little bit. So Banting, the Banting diet, I mean, this was uh, a very old 
diet, or, or banting, I believe it was in the 20s. Uh, I, I don't remember the exact decade, but this is... 1860. 60, okay, 80. yeah. Okay, 1860. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so this is, you know, this has been around for 150 plus years. We had the resurgence of the Atkins diets, I would say, what, 80s, 1980s, 1990s. Uh, that was popular for a while. So, you know, there's been a couple, I would say, false starts. Um, what's different today versus, you know, the initial banting introduction in 1860s, the initial, the introduction of Atkins in 1980s? Was it a difference in the specific nuances of how to apply this low carbohydrate diet? Or is there just a much better understanding of how to measure the physiological health markers uh what's different today versus the previous false starts i think one false start was that the the atkins diet was taking off in the early 2000s okay. and then he died sadly and then that killed it for people said oh he died because of x y and z which wasn't true his diet didn't kill him and i think what's changed now is that the, the internet and and social media has helped but I think the science is coming through, and you can tell the science is coming through because the backlash is huge. Industry's backlash and getting published rubbish data, which is absolutely appalling. There's just been this onslaught of nonsensical science, which is being published by major journals in, in Britain and the United States. And it just shows how scared they are because they're allowing this rubbish to be published. So I, I think that's what's happening. And, and let's not forget, the company that lives very close to you, Verta Health, which has now shown that we can reverse type 2 diabetes. Mm -hmm. That is a massive, massive event. And if it hadn't been for Verta Health, we would still be 10 years away from showing that you can reverse type 2 diabetes. They accelerated the acceptance of it. And I, the impact of Verta Health, you have to understand, the American Diabetes Association has finally this year except that the low carbohydrate diet can be used in the treatment of diabetes because they couldn't ignore the Verta health data. So that is, that is a major change because they've, for the last 50 years, they've been promoting high carbohydrate diets as healthy for diabetics. And now they've got to say, actually a low carbohydrate diet is acceptable treatment. Right. I mean, for folks that might not have seen that paper, this was a one, two year study, a one year study. I, I don't want to, Oh, two years, yeah. Yeah, it's a two-year study of a low-carbohydrate diet, and and I think Verta Health has a app to help people go through and coach them through some of these applications. But it's essentially a, a ketogenic diet, um, and people essentially got off insulin. People's fasted glucose, fasted insulin would drop. I mean, I, those are impressive results. And. Uh, Perhaps to uh, dive into the, some of the steel manning of the other side of the argument, some might describe that this is, you, you didn't cure the root cause of carbohydrate intolerance. You just have managed the condition. Did you actually uh, manage type 2 diabetes or did you actually cure type 2 diabetes? Um, for some of the more nuanced discussion there, I think it's unquestionable that you're managing this right? People don't need insulin as much. They, they, can, they can reduce their insulin load. Um, but when people reintroduce carbohydrate back into their life is that, it, my understanding is that you don't reverse that carbohydrate intolerance necessarily. Uh, what are your thoughts there? Oh, absolutely. It's semantics, but you, you see the carbohydrates is the problem. It's like if you're using poison. <laughs> so for us with diabetes, carbohydrates are poison. So we can never start eating the poison again. It's going to activate the illness again so that that's a reality you can't reverse insulin resistance because insulin resistance probably is beneficial in people eating high fat diets but it's not beneficial if you eating a high carbohydrate diet why would insulin resistance be so prevalent as a genetic component of so many populations in the world yeah you know like the australian aborigines profoundly insulin resistant also the the people living in the Pacific Islands, very, very insulin resistant. And, and why, why, would that, why would that be? It has to have some biological reason, some survival value. Right. So I, I wouldn't want to get rid of my insulin resistance. I just don't want to activate it with a high carbohydrate diet. Interesting. So maybe this is a protective mechanism, it's sort of the analogy that this is an ambulance on the scene and not necessarily 
a, a, yeah. a causal factor, which is interesting. Um, obviously, I think I think you're right. Over the last three five years, this banting diet, this low carb diet notion has really taken off, and I would say within the last year carnivore this notion of only eating meat has taken off and we've we've spoken to a number of folks who are advocating that and i've seen you post and uh discuss that a little bit curious to hear your thoughts on on carnivore um i've actually experimented with carnivore myself doing you know a, a couple four week blocks of carnivore um curious to hear your thoughts on on this new Somewhat fringe, perhaps fringe, perhaps interesting diet. Well, when I first started writing about the high fat diet, the I got letters from people who said they reversed their type two diabetes, and I said it's impossible. I don't believe you. And now we now accept that that this diet can reverse type two diabetes. The messages we're getting now is people reversing their autoimmune disease on the carnivore plant free diet, plant based diet that there's no plants in it. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, I think that's the next generation of effects. That if I was a scientist today and I was treating people with autoimmune disease, I would like to see what happens if we put them on a completely diet that is completely free of plant plants, foods, and only carnivorous. And we're going to have some spectacular results. I don't suggest <laughs> it to anyone, yeah. but there will be some spectacular results. And then you can start understanding what's causing autoimmune disease. And there, there's Nobel Prize waiting out there. So if I was at the University of California, San Francisco, that's what I'd be doing. If I was a gastroenterologist or dealing with other autoimmune diseases, I'd be studying that. I know we have PhD students out there listening, so a Nobel Prize tip here. Quickest way to the Nobel Prize. <laughs> so what would you say was the hypothesized mechanism of action here? So, you know, people oh, right. have talked about plants being uh some of the polyphenols are actually triggering immune reaction what would you hypothesize is in plant material that is not in animal material that is triggering this what, what would you specify what would you, what would you hypothesize i think that it's the leaky gut syndrome that there's something in plants with like lectins or other or other agents that cause uh, the leaky gut to develop, they cause the enterocytes to move apart and then allows the bacteria mm. or bacterial protein to get in. And you cross-react with a protein that comes in which looks like one of your tissues. And so you produce an antibody or another response, a, a, a cell-based response to that. And so you get autoimmune disease. It is so simple and it's so obviously probably wrong, but it's such an obvious hypothesis to test that that's what I would be doing. I would be looking for leaky gut, reversing the leaky gut and the autoimmune disease healing itself. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think the case studies or the N equals one anecdotes suggest there is some signal here. I mean, I think that's, to me, is the, fun, the foundation of science. You see some observation, like there's a you know quite a number of folks who are claiming some autoimmune uh, disease uh, attenuation or, or some sort of fix with a carnivore diet, there's clearly some signal there. And I think it is premature for folks or, or professional doctors or, or, or researchers to say that, that is completely wrong. I mean, I think the curious mind would say, why is that happening? There seems to be some signal here. Can we investigate? And if people do the research and it is wrong, then we will know. But now I think if we just completely ignore it, I think that's unscientific. A fascinating conversation. I'm sure we could go on for, you know, a, a few hours here. But I always want to wrap up with one one final question here, um, and that is, if you had infinite resources, infinite subjects, you could do whatever you want with them. What would be the one trial, the one study that you would want to run, uh, and and how would you set that up? You can put people in the metabolic wards. You can put people in the cage. Whatever you want. What is the Tim Noakes experiment? One of them would be the carnivore diet and its role in autoimmune disease. I think to me that would be one of the most spectacular interventions. I think the reversal of dementias with interventions like ketone bodies, uh, that would be really interesting. Mm. But I think that the damage has been done to some extent. And I'm not sure uh, how, how we could go forward there. The other one is cancer. And I would love to study cancer on this low-carb diet, plus a whole bunch of other supplements. Mm. 
you know, I get feedback from people who use supplementary treatment for cancer. And five years ago, I said, they're all quacks. It's nonsense. It can't work. But I would like to, to consider that. In other words, it's not just the ketogenic, sorry, it's not the ketogenic diet. It's the addition of ketones and it's the addition of other supplements. And I think that that would be a really, really interesting. So I would focus on autoimmune disease and I would focus on cancer. Because if we can show that we can reverse those two or put those two conditions into remission, uh, that would be that would completely revolutionize medicine. Via a low carb diet intervention. Yeah, off the top of my head, I think that we've solved the diabetes issue. Yeah. And although we continue to research it, I think we've got it. And finally, because obviously I know your interest, I, I think there's the use of ketones in medical conditions needs to be addressed. Yeah. And just to finish up, when I was last with you and I was given some of your products and my ketone body shot up and my glucose shot down, it was astonishing. Yeah. I couldn't yeah. believe it. Yeah. So there was, there's a treatment for, for high glucose. The effect was greater than the dr drugs I take for controlling my blood glucose. Yeah, work to be done there. That's a very interesting signal. Absolutely. We're looking into it. The role of ketones in health is, is a huge area. But there we go. Professor Tim Noakes, thank you so much for your time. Really a pleasure to have this conversation and hope to speak to you soon. Thank you for all the wonderful questions and the, the chat. I really, really appreciate it. And good luck to you and great success for your company. All right. Cheers. Thank you so much. Thanks for tuning in this week, everyone. If you want to learn more about HVMN and our offerings, visit www.hvmn.com slash pod. Also, by writing a review on our iTunes page and sending a screenshot to podcast at hvmn.com, we'll hook you up with $15 worth of HVMN store credit. Our last shout out goes out to our listener survey, which lets us know who you are better so we can continue making episodes you find most valuable. Visit go.hvmn.com slash podcast survey for that survey. It'll only take a few minutes and new submissions are eligible for an HVMN ketone giveaway. Until next time, eat well, train smart, and live your life.